Okay, cool. Uh, good evening, everyone. I think we can get us started. Uh, thanks for joining uh, our meeting uh, today. Um, and I hope you all had a great uh, Easter break. So today we're going to continue uh, our, basically the point that we uh, couldn't finish uh, last, in the last meeting. We were discussing about SSD organization, as well as uh, NAND flash chip organization, like the you know that we have uh, at a very uh, low level we have uh, flash cells and then we combine flash cells to make a page and then combine uh, i mean including several pages we can make block and several blocks uh, several blocks uh, they make a plane and then plane uh, a few of planes we have dies and then chip and that's all so we we wanted also to discuss how we do read and write operations inside the nand flash memory but yeah, basically we couldn't uh, finish it uh, in the last meeting. So I'm gonna uh, discuss about it uh, today. So this is a, a very brief reminder uh, to jog your memory. So a flash cell basically is a transistor, as you, as you remember, uh, the difference is that we have a floating gate uh, in 2D NAND flash memory or charge trap in 3D NAND flash memory. So basically that floating gate uh, can hold electrons in a non-volatile manner. So whenever you want to program a cell, you need to apply a high voltage, high programming voltage. And that uh, programming, high programming voltage causes uh, some electrons to be trapped in the floating gate. And as a result of that, basically your negative charge is uh, high at the gate and you need to apply a higher uh, positive voltage to turn on that transistor. Basically it causes to increase uh, you know, the threshold voltage. And whenever you want to basically verify that it's your uh, flight cell is programmed or is still in erase mode, you need to apply a reference voltage, which is the somewhere between basically the, the nominal threshold voltage uh, here, which is like in the erase mode, and the, the high uh, threshold voltage, which is in the program mode. And based on the, so when you apply VREF, depending on the transistor that basically turned on or not, you will decide, you will realize that uh, if you have programmed it or not. And when you want to erase it, uh, basically you need to apply a negative uh, voltage, a high negative voltage uh, between the gate and substrate, uh, such that you can basically remove electrons from that floating gate. But remember that I said that basically this erasing procedure is not perfect. So whenever you do some erasing, it's also, it's possible that you uh, basically, you cannot get to that nominal uh, threshold voltage uh, exactly back. So there could be some electrons that, you know, they stay uh, still in the, in, the, in the floating gate, or you may even actually push more electrons back to the substrate. So uh, these things can happen. And as a result, basically these programming array cycles uh, is limited. The number of time that you can do program and arrays in flash cells are limited. And after some time, basically, uh, like, let's say 10,000 10, uh, program array cycles, you cannot reliably use your flash cells. So now let's uh, talk about a little more about this threshold voltage distribution. So basically, uh, threshold voltage of cells in a program page block and chip Usually we have this kind of you know uh, plot that basically we have a distribution of threshold voltage in the erase mode. I mean, including all the cells that you have in your flash chip, and uh, also this is the distribution uh, for the zero. So it's not like you know all cells uh, they have exactly the same threshold voltage for the erase mode, and they have exactly the same threshold voltage for the program mode. So you you really have a distribution for that. And with this, actually, you can see that we really need a gap between the erase mode and the program mode, such that when, whenever you apply reference voltage, it does not really overlap with any of these steps, which actually, it, uh, in the end, it, it, that would happen, uh, which we will also see in some of uh, future lectures, that uh, that's actually one of the reasons uh, for, uh, you know, for uh, unreliable reads from flash memory, or let's say error-prone read from flash memory. So basically, uh, so we have distribution. The reason is that we have variations across the cells. So some cells are more easily programmed or erased. So whenever you design or you build a, your, your flash chip, 
there are basically you have uh, process variation and some cells basically they they are uh, you know uh, fabricated with lower threshold voltage some of them with higher uh, threshold voltage and whenever you also want to program some cells are easy to program some cells are not easy so in the end you're going to have such kind of uh, you know distribution and you can actually think about it in a in a multi level cell so in this picture uh, we have this slc mode that we have only one and zero but you can actually have you know uh, 2 to the power m um, threshold states to store m bits in a single flash cell so here you can see that we have eight um, basically states in order to store three bits and when and when and you can actually encode uh, these states to three bit uh, basically in any way that you want. Uh, of course, there are some good encoding, there are some bad encoding, and there are also some encoding that you cannot really. So for the there are uh, for there there could be many different encoding that they can they could make sense. So depending on the use case, depending on the workload characterization, and the way that you want to use your flash memory. Uh, you may end up using different uh, encoding techniques. We're going to also see a trade-off about encoding very soon in this lecture. But yeah, so when, when you, for example, in this MLC architecture, uh, like, I mean, specifically this one is TLC, that we store uh, three bits per cell, you can actually ca call this MSB, CSB, and LSB, like in three bits that you have. And essentially, you store three pages per word line. Um, in, in flash memory. So when you increase the number of uh, states, uh, in the end, what happened is that we have limited uh, basically bits for each window and actually the gap between windows are also so small. So in so that that makes things so hard, you know, to, to read reliably from flash memory. So in order, so we need to guarantee sufficient margin between adjacent VTH states. Uh, but yeah, so the thing is that after time, this uh, threshold voltage changes after programmed, after reading from flash memory, and it's not only shifting, uh, you know, through the uh, through this v uh, threshold, uh, you know, access. It can be also widened uh, after program. So it's, you can see that. Basically, uh, the distribution was sharper before, and after several programs, or as well, uh, are also reading. Now you can see that we it's also widening, and as a result of that, you in, at some point basically these uh, uh, distributions curves they're gonna overlap at some point, and basically, and you will end up reading with some errors, and that's re that's the reason that we really need uh, ECC to correct errors. So until you know some amount of uh, at some certain point, still uh, you can you know rely on ECC and correct your errors. But after some time, basically, uh, you cannot fix your errors. So you if you have the original data that you have written in that uh, page or uh, that row, uh, basically you can rewrite it and make it basically you know uh, resolve the issues. That's why actually we sometimes we do refreshing. So we don't really wait until basically we lost our data. So after some time that we see that our results, our uh, data is getting corrupted, we actually do refresh just to make sure that we don't reach to the point that we cannot correct errors. Uh, but yeah, but if you don't have access to your original data and you have errors, basically there is no way to, uh, you know, to construct your original data. Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, as I said, uh, th these gonna have overlap and we have uh, lower reliability, we have narrower margins. And basically in the end, overall, it's a trade-off between number of bits per cell and also the reliability. So nowadays, most of SSDs like the enterprise SSDs are uh, usually uh, TLC. Some of them also these days are considering to have a QLC SSDs. In the past, uh, QLC SSDs are mostly uh, used for uh, only cheap devices, you know, cheap devices that you won't just care about huge uh, capacity. But uh, but QLC SSDs is also uh, taking its step to enterprise systems as well. But if you really want to have high, you know, maximum reliability as well as 
speed. You know, you want a really fast device. Uh, you really need to go with SLC mode programming. But yeah, but at the price of you know lower density and lower capacity. So in the end, it's going to be a trade-off analysis in your design space exploration. Okay. Any questions so far? Good. So now let's see how we can do page a program, how we can program a page. So this is a, a block uh, that you can see here. Uh, these are the bit lines that we have, and uh, these are also the NAND strings connected. So you know that we program uh, basically at the page granularity. So uh, this is the target page that we want to program in. So for simplicity, actually, we consider SLC programming here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, MLC programming, TLC, QLC can be also done uh, with some, uh, you know, with more accurate uh, control. So when you want to program, basically there are some uh, other cells, you know, in this beta string that you don't really, uh, you know, you don't want to touch them. You don't want to program them. So you apply a V pass to them. And uh, so as I said, V pass uh, is actually high enough to turn on those transistors. So it's not gonna, basically, uh, V pass is uh, high enough to turn on those transistors and also does not have the effect of programming. Even though there are also some works that they show that uh, basically V pass, it is because it's high, but it still it is not also you know the high program voltage. But it can cause some uh, some effect of weak programming. You know, uh, so basically applying V pass to uh, to flash cells can cause also some kind of programming and it can change the threshold voltage. And I, actually there are some works in, uh, that uh, they try to uh, basically modify uh, the, the, this V pass depending on the reliability of the cells. And uh, you know, if we really need, to, what would be the nominal voltage for V pass? So we will also see the, uh, such works, uh, works later in this course. But yeah, so you apply V pass and then there is a row that you apply V program. So you when you, when you want to write uh, your data, you can see that, for example, imagine that your data is like this, 0, 1, 0, 1, something, and in the end, 0. So you know that uh, for those cells that you want to write 1, uh, you don't really need to do anything because all cells are, uh, you know, are um, they have been erased already. So if you don't program them, you will read one, right? Uh, because we encode like this. We encode uh, erase situ state as one and program state as zero. So for those cells that they have, uh, you know, that you are uh, aiming to write one, you don't really need to program. But for those cells that you want to write zero, you need to program. So in, in flash memory, there is a way to handle it uh, by uh, basically with the process of inhibit, inhibiting. So basically, uh, you need to inhibit cells to uh, to not be programmed. So by applying basically VCC to the bit line. So for those cells that you want to program, you connect bit line to ground. And for those cells that you don't want to program them, you apply them to VCC. Uh, that's the way that we can handle it. So this is the status of the page, uh, you know, before programming. So all cells are in erase mode. But when you apply V program, you want to reach to something like this, right? Uh, you apply V program. So there are some inhibited cells that uh, basically they don't, uh, the, yeah, they, their threshold voltage uh, uh, do not change. So they, they stay in the erase mode. But for other cells, we basically program them. So this is what you expect to reach. But unfortunately, uh, if you apply V program, that high V program voltage, like 20 volt uh, I mentioned, at once, you will get to something like this. There are some cells that they are, you know, easy to program. <coughs> and there are some cells that they are hard to program. So in the end, uh, we get to this distribution, which is really not useful, right? You're going to have a lot of errors uh, when you want to access your flash cells. In order to basically tackle this issue, uh, people come up with this incremental step pulse programming, ISPP. 
that uh, you apply program voltage uh, step by step. So you don't apply the highest program voltage at once. And uh, you apply something below that, but you increase that program uh, voltage uh, basically step by step. So when you apply V program zero, uh, some cells, basically this is gonna be the distribution. So we have some cells that they are inhibited, which is good. But some cells that you want to program, some of them still, you can see that many of them are before reference voltage, but there are also some cells that they are getting, uh, you know, the threshold higher than VREF. So what we do is that we apply V program zero, and then we verify uh, what are the cells that they have been programmed already by simply reading, you know? And uh, if, if those, uh, those cells, they have been programmed already, you can inhibit them again in the next cycle. So, so for the cells that uh, basically you wanted to write zero, and after verification, you see that, okay, I was successfully, uh, you know, write, uh, I, I could uh, basically, I managed to write zero, then you just inhibit for the next cycle. So you apply VCC to bit line such that you can skip the, the this ISPP process for those sets. So basically imagine that this bit line two is verified as program. So you apply VCC uh, to inhibit as a program cells, and then you apply V program one again. And then uh, it can, it will uh, shift the uh, basically distribution, uh, you know, curve a little bit more and you do it step by step such that hopefully you get to this beautiful, um, you know, distribution uh, plot. So that's the way that, uh, you know, people implement ISPP as a as an incremental step pulse program, which is really, I mean, essential um, for flash memory. Uh, we also, uh, we will we will discuss our work flash cosmos i think next week that we use uh, flash memory to do computation so in in flash cosmos you will also see that how we can modify ispp to even to even to basically improve reliability even more so we actually modify ispp and make it propose something like uh, something called uh, enhanced slc programming and with that you can actually increase the gap between these two steps uh, states one and zero even more and make this uh, program uh, state even sharper. So yeah, you will uh, also get uh, familiar with that hopefully uh, in the next lecture. Okay. So now that we are done with the program, uh, are there any questions? If not, I'm going to talk about how we read. Okay, good. So for reading uh, from page, uh, basically uh, all the word lines that you don't, uh, you, they say they are not your target. You need to apply V pass, as I said. But remember what I said also, you know, whenever you apply V pass, it can actually, uh, you know, have effect of weak programming and that cause some reliability issues that we will uh, discuss later uh, in future lectures. But yeah, you apply VREF uh, to the to the to the row that you want to target. You want to read it, and other rows you apply VPass. And uh, and basically, uh, you need to charge all bit lines to VCC, like the in initialization mode. We will actually see it a little bit uh, later in this lecture how this circuit actually works. But yeah, you need to initialize uh, bit lines as well as your sensing circuitry uh, in order to read from your flash memory. So if we observe that basically, uh, you know, the the current by applying VREF, the current of bit line, uh, you know, like this uh, flows, we realize that basically that uh, flash cell was, you know, program, uh, sorry, uh, was erased and uh, we encode it as one. And the other case we encode as zero. So this is what you know, but how exactly we realized that, you know, the bit line current, uh, uh, did flow or did not flow, uh, we will see later in this lecture with, with some circuit information. But uh, imagine that you know this, uh, let's uh, have a look at MLC or TLC in this uh, case. So uh, you, you want to, this, this is your basically uh, word line. And you, you can see that you are storing three pages uh, in this word line. 
And uh, you want to read the page, uh, the center page, or CSB, central uh, significant bit, or center significant bit. So you want to read that bit. So in, in this, uh, basically, uh, TLC mode, because we have eight uh, states, you're going to have like seven reference voltages, right? Uh, between every two distribution, you can have a reference voltage. And that reference voltage can be used to distinguish between basically, uh, you know, above or after that uh, reference voltage or lower than uh, reference voltage. So you really need the basic reference voltage for every uh, for every of these uh, margin that you have. Uh, so whenever you want to read a bit, you need to actually check for the uh, for the reference voltage that you can actually see a toggle. In, in that uh, CSB bit, depending on your encoding uh, technique. So here our encoding is that uh, we encode erase the state as 111. The next state is as 110, the next one 100, and so on and so forth. So for CSB, you can see that between erase the state and P1, we don't really see a toggle. So basically that means that VREF0 is really not important for reading CSB. But from P1 to P2, you can see that uh, CSB is changing. So VREF1 is important. Uh, VREF2 uh, is not important again. Uh, VREF3 uh, is important because you can see a toggle. And uh, as well as VREF5. So now you have three reference voltages that basically you need to apply them one by one. So you apply uh, VREF1. I already mentioned these things. So you apply, uh, first you apply VREF5. So depending on the, basically the threshold voltage of these uh, cells, you will uh, read one or zero, right? So for this cell, because it's, you know, it, it has uh, one, 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 which is the lowest state, like the erased state, uh, definitely you will read as one, right? Uh, for zero, 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 you also will read it as one because the threshold voltage is lower than VREF5. For one, zero, one, you will read zero. For zero, zero, for this zero, you will read zero. And for this one, you will read one. So these are uh, mostly correct, but this one is, you know, is not correct. Because VREF5 is not enough to read, you know, this CSP. So you need to continue that and apply other reference voltages as well. So you apply a VREF3 as well, and this is the result for a VREF3, and then you apply VREF1, and this is the result for VREF1. So now you have actually three outputs uh, for basically for either of these uh, reference voltages. And you, you need to somehow combine these outputs to come up with the final value, basically the correct value that you were looking for. So you can actually check uh, at, uh, as a homework, as a homework if you are interested. But in this uh, specific encoding, you can actually easily XOR. Uh, if you XOR uh, basically these red value, you can actually get to the final, to the correct value that you are looking for. Okay. Any questions? Okay, Gary. So now let's uh, conclude this uh, read with some takeaways. So basically, bit encoding affects the read latency. Uh, basically, we need to see here for reading, like uh, as, you know, in this encoding technique, uh, in order to read CSP, we had to do three sensing, right? So we had so every uh, read is actually three reads, uh, and that can be quite costly. So now let's uh, compare the number of sensing for uh, LSB in these two encoding. Uh, any of you want to speak up and mention some numbers? Who is uh, who volunteers for the first for the top uh, encoding, and who volunteers for the bottom encoding?
So I'm going to pick uh, Ludwig. Ludwig, can you tell me num the number of sensing for reading LSP in the in this encoding, the, the top the top one? Yes, I can try that. Mm -hmm. so I think um, we will need to always read the apply the reference at the border where like the two uh, where the, both the neighboring ones have different values for the LSP. So yes, I think we would exactly. have have two uh, v references that would be vref zero and vref four. Exactly. Yeah, that's precise. Uh, could you repeat that, please? I why it's like that? I can catch it. Yes, I can try no. to uh, repeat mm -hmm. it. Um, so we always have to look at the least significant bit, and if for uh, these different e or p one two p seven. If they are neighbors and they have different values for the least significant bit, then we need to check the uh, re-reference between them. OK, thank you. Perfect. Yeah. So maybe and now you can uh, tell us about uh, the number of sensing for LSP uh, for the bottom uh, encoding. Uh, are you me? Yes, or... I'm. A... Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> you. So the least significant bit. Sorry, the least significant bit is different between E and P1, uh, mm -hmm. P2 and P3, and P4 and P5, and P6 and P7. So we would have to check their v -ref. Yes. So we have like four sensing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's that the thing. that would be uh, mm -hmm. uh, VREF0, VREF1, VREF4, uh, and VREF6. Yes. Yeah, I think we ref two instead of we ref one, right? Oh yeah. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That's exactly correct. So basically, you can see here, uh, different encoding, uh, you know, can cause different latency when you want to read LSB. So for the if you encode like the top figure, like the top uh, plot, you can um, basically read your LSB with only two sensing, uh, which is faster compared to the bottom uh, plot. But how about uh, basically how about the the LSP so, uh, the MSP? So for MSP, the top one you can read it with uh, two sensing because P two to P three and also P six to P seven. But for this one, uh, you can read uh, MSP with only one sensing. So now you can actually see a trade off, right? Uh, so the the bottom one. Uh, Basically, is the, the performance is poor for reading LSP, but it's actually quite fast for reading MSP. The top uh, basically uh, plot provides kind of you know uh, balance latency between the, the LSP and MSP reading. So that actually gives some you know trade off uh, in your design space, as well as some you know uh, idea about how you can actually benefit from that. So there are also some works that they consider you know the the bottom uh, encoding like this uh, this one and they since uh, reading msp is actually much faster than reading lsp they can actually use msp as uh, uh, basically as a as a cache for lsp so not uh, not only cache or the, for, for example the, the 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 pages that they are they need faster response they are on the critical path we uh, we usually try to store them in the MSP mode, so uh, th that gives you some you know uh, freedom in your design. So how you can want to do how do you, are you going to benefit from different encoding and different uh, architecture uh, decision architectural decisions. So this, this is a still actually one of the active research uh, direction in uh, in this area. But people are trying to, you know, come up with a better, different encoding, and actually the effect of encoding on basic other aspects of the system. Okay, um, I think that's clear, right? Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a good question. What would happen yeah. if we, uh, in the bottom part, if we read the LSP but we sense only ones, for example, only VREF zero? Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Could you please repeat it? We have, um, the answer to the question earlier was we have, if we want to read the LSP, 
then we have to sense it four times. But what yeah, exactly. if we sense it only one time? Oh, okay. So if you sense it only one time, uh, you know, this will happen. You 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 will read uh, you know, as, as I mentioned here, for example. So the, this uh, this circuit, this encoding, uh, in order to root, to read the CSP, for example, here, you need to apply uh, three uh, reference voltages, right? Uh, because you have toggle uh, in three states between P1 to P2, uh, between um, P3 and P4, and between uh, P4, P5 and P6. So if you only apply, for example, VREF5, you can see that you uh, you you read almost correct. I mean, at least in this example, but this one is incorrect. So you you are supposed to read zero, but you read one. So you need to actually keep applying uh, other reference voltages as well. And at some point, uh, combine all these uh, you know all these uh, red value using a function to come up with the final correct value. So in this encoding, uh, I I already mentioned that you can easily XOR uh, values and get the final value. So yeah, so basically here also for LSB, if you you need to apply four reference voltages, if you apply only one reference voltage, likely you will read with error. And I, I would say that your errors would be also much higher than the ACC uh, you know, correction capability. So you're, you can, you're not able to correct um, errors, probably. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks a lot. Sure. Thanks for the question. OK, uh, yeah, I think we are done uh, with this uh, read-write. Now I want to provide uh, very brief information about sensing circuitry, just to give you more idea about how uh, basically sensing is happening inside the flash chip. So in uh, for read mechanism that uh, in NAND flash uh, we implement, we have three steps, pre-charge, Evaluation and discharge. So pre-charge is very similar to initialization. I mean, the, exactly what we said. Like the, we need to, um, you know, we need to charge the bit line, you know, to VCC. And evaluation, if you want to realize, it's actually the phase that you need to you, you will evaluate. That basically, if a bit line current uh, uh, has been uh, basically did flow or did not flow. So that, that happened in the evaluation step. And this charge is actually discharging the bit line to make it ready for uh, future steps, future reads. So in this uh, basically plot, uh, this figure, you can, uh, this uh, yeah, this figure, you can actually see these uh, pre-charge evaluation and discharge step. So we, we this is your NAND string, uh, you know, at the bottom. And this is basically a VREF, you know, that we apply to a target cell. And other cells they get V pass. So we have a circuitry here, like, like a latch circuitry that we will also see this circuit very soon. But we also have a capacitor here, um, and this is the, your basically this is the, your bit line, and this is the capacitor. So you first upload, you know, activate these precharge transistors, you know, in a in a initialization mode. And you charge your bit line to V pre or V pre charge, which can be like, as I said, like VCC, right? So as a result, uh, this uh, SO or uh, you know uh, capacitor is going to also be charged to the high voltage, and that's the key mechanism here. And after uh, basically for the evaluation part, we deactivated this switch, and uh, basically the the you know the current or the, the voltage in this capacitor is going to be discharged or not, depending on the status of that uh, transistor or that flash cells that we want to read it. And after that, we need to discharge everything. OK. I already explained. Basically, this is the pre-charge state. And for the evaluation, you need to deactivate the pre-charge and the, the, deactivate the switch. And we enable this latching circuitry, uh, which we will see very soon. So it can actually, the, 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 the voltage of this capacitor can be uh, discharged or not, depending on the status of this uh, flash cell.
And after that, you need to discharge. Basically, you need to discharge bit lines to return the NAND string to its initial state for future operations. Okay. So now let's uh, take a very uh, detailed look at this latch circuitry, how it's implemented. So before the evaluation step, the chip uh, initializes, initializes the latching circuit. So th this is uh, your bit line here. And also your uh, bit string is actually also connected. Your NAND string is also connected to bit line. And this is also this uh, transistor, M3, that was this switch here. So you have a transistor here, M3, and this is the, your uh, pre-charge voltage. So in the initialization mode, or let's say in the uh, pre-charge mode, you need to, you, you activate uh, transistor free. And uh, so that cause that basically this, uh, the voltage of SO is gonna be high, right? And in this latch circuitry, you can see that you, we have this back-to-back -back knot, you know, like the uh, basically the two knots that they are connected uh, as in a feedback loop and back-to-back. -back. And you have two transistors, M1 and M2. So what you do is that uh, you in, in the initialization mode, you activate transistor M1 as well. So what's, what does happen exactly? So this uh, M3 is on. So this uh, circuit is going to be connected. So then VSO is going to be high or, v or one, let's say. So since the uh, gate voltage of this transistor is also high, so this transistor is also on. So now we have a, basically this point is connected to zero, right? And since we activate transistor M1, so we have a pass through this point, this node of circuit to the ground, right? So as a result, uh, the voltage of this out bar is gonna be zero because it's connected to zero. However, M2 is not uh, connected. So V out is only drive, is only uh, be driven by, uh, by this uh, you know, back to back knot. And since uh, V out bar is zero, then V out is gonna be one. So this is the initialization mode uh, that when you look at your uh, latch circuitry, you see that V out bar is zero and V out is one. When you want to read it uh, in the evaluation step, basically what you do is that you disable uh, this uh, transistor pre-charge here so you need to disable it. And also you need to disable M1. And now you enable M2. So if, uh, if basically the current uh, in bit nine uh, flows, what happens is that the capacitor here, like the VSO is gonna be discharged, right? So you will gonna have zero. And as a result of that, this transistor is gonna be turned off and your connection to, uh, to ground is gonna be disconnected, right? So even though you enable M2, but you don't have really connection to ground. And this one is also disconnected because you disable M1 and there is no connection to ground anymore. And in the end, as a result, basically your output does not change, right? You, you, you keep the, what you have, uh, basically what you have uh, driven in these two nodes uh, from the previous step in the pre-charge state, which is correct, right? You wanted to uh, read one and you can read, and now you're reading one. So the, this value is actually the one that you read. Uh, but if the bit line current does not flow because of you know that fly cell that has been programmed, and your uh, tar uh, reference voltage couldn't turn on the transistor, so bit line current, bit line current does not flow, and this uh, capacitor maintains its uh, charge. As a result, this transistor is going to be uh, is going to be kept uh, on, and your connection to ground is still there. So now that you enable M2, you will connect basically this node to ground. And uh, basically, uh, the, the voltage of out is going to basically discharge from one to zero. 
And V out bar is going to be basically, uh, you know, reverse because it's connected to this back-to-back -back knot. And M1 is also disconnected, right? So V out bar is not going to be discharged uh, by this by this ground. It's going to be driven only by through this back-to-back -back knot. And now you are reading zero, which is again correct. So I try to explain it uh, as much as possible, but it might be also a little bit confusing. Uh, let me know if uh, I need to repeat anything here. OK. I hope uh, my explanation was clear then. So an interesting insight here, actually, is that you can enable inverse read as well. So here, uh, you know, we read uh, exactly the same as what we have written. Like we have, we store one, we also read one, we store zero, we read zero. But you can actually play with this circuitry uh, by changing the the order of activations, and then you read inverse basically. So you want it. So if you uh, store one, you read zero, and when you store zero, you read one. And in order to do that, you just need to, you know, change the simply changing the activation sequence of M1 and M2. So in the pre-charge state, instead of um, activating M1 transistor, we, we activate M2. And in the evaluation step, we activate, uh, we deactivate M2 and we activate M1. And with that, actually, you can read inverse easily. Uh, in this plot, you can also see the reason. Is that clear? I have a question for this. So the theory is clear, but uh, does uh -huh. this work on uh, real NAND chips without anything special? Yes, yes. Actually, it's implemented. And yeah, it works uh, for real NAND flash chips. Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. So with this inverse read, actually, you can implement NOT operation. And it's actually one of the, uh, you know, the, one of the key uh, technique that we have used in our Flash Cosmos paper that we use uh, basically propose uh, computation inside the Flash memory. So it's not only actually not operation. We also show that how we can do AND and OR and combination of AND and OR as well as NAND and NOR, XOR and XNOR. So uh, yeah, so we're going to have a, so next week uh, on, on Tuesday, at the same time, we're going to have a lecture on about Flash Cosmos that we go into it in uh, a lot of detail. But yeah, basically the, the, the reason that we can do not operation is what I already mentioned, is that inverse read that is already supported in the in basically state-of-the-art NAND flash memories. OK, great. Any questions? If not, I think. Uh, yeah, we are done uh, for today. Uh, thanks a lot for joining today's meeting, and I hope to see you all next week. Uh, I'm sorry, one last question. Uh, the yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, on the on this uh, website of the PNS, I still cannot open the slides for the lectures. Uh, can you? Oh, okay. That? Yeah, yeah, I will. Uh, I will check it right after the the lecture and perfect. Amazing. Fix the problem. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for mentioning. Thank you. Great. Okay, perfect. Uh, then see you all next week and have a nice have a have a nice day. Have a nice day. Yes. Still is the day. <laughs> bye bye. Have a nice day. Have a nice evening as well. Bye bye. Yeah. Have a nice one. Bye bye. Um are there any deadlines that we should be concerned about? about our projects or is that dependent on the project? Hmm. Uh, le let me stop 